What is accretion? Simply stated, as defined by Article 1015 of the Civil Code, it is a right by virtue of which when there is a vacancy in inheritance caused by predecease, incapacity, or repudiation. In case two or more persons are called to the same inheritance or same legacy or same device, the vacant portion is given to his co-heirs, co-legatees, or co-devices. That's basically what accretion is all about. A very simple illustration. I say in my will, I give my house and lot in Quezon City to my friends A, B, and C. There is unity of object. Only one item of property is given and plurality of subjects. It is given to more than one individual, A, B, and C. If Mr. A should predecease me, nauna siyang namatay sa akin, his one-third share in the thousand lot will go by accretion to his co-devices, B and C. That's essentially what accretion is all about. If I say, I give the entire free portion of my estate to A, B, and C, and A is incapacitated or repudiates, then his one-third share in the free portion would go to B and C by right of accretion. Article 1016 of the Civil Code gives us the requisites for accretion in testamentary succession. First, two or more persons are called to the same inheritance or to the same portion thereof pro indiviso. Second, that there is a vacancy caused by RIP, repudiation, incapacity, or predecease. What about in interstate succession? When is there accretion? We find the provisions of Article 1018. The law says, in legal succession, the share of the person who repudiates shall always accrue to his co-heirs. So, what about in incapacity and predecease in interstate succession? Is there also a right of accretion? Actually, that's a, one of the open questions. It's a disputed point. One school of thought, there is accretion in interstate succession, even in case of incapacity and predecease. Applying by analogy Article 1016. The other view is that there is no accretion in interstate succession in case of incapacity and predecease. Why? 1018, in dealing with interstate succession, mentions only repudiation. If the intention is to include predecease and incapacity, the law would have expressly mentioned them too. Moreover, according to some civilists, like Justice Orado, sabi niya, in reality, there is no vacancy in interstate succession in the case of predecease or incapacity. There is a vacancy in interstate succession only in case of repudiation. All right. Can there be accretion if what has been given is money or other fungible things? The answer is yes. As long as there has been no earmarking. What is meant by earmarking? Physical segregation. So, if I say in my will, I give the balance of my savings account at BPI to my friend A. I give the balance of my current account at Metrobank to my friend B. And I give my friend C the money which I keep in my filing cabinet at home. If A dies ahead of me, predeceases, will there be accretion in favor of B and C? There will be none. Because there has been earmarking. There is physical segregation. All right. The problem really is determining when to apply accretion and when to apply the other rules of succession in dealing with vacancies. Perhaps at this point we should pause and then look at what we have discussed so far and look at succession from a higher vantage point. What is the principal underlying principle in our law on succession? I mean, I think, based on one of the theories of succession, Anong theory? Succession is merely an extension of the rights of ownership. Di ba? Kung ikaw may ari, dapat may karapatan ka rin. You should have also the right, if you're the owner of property, to determine who will benefit from your property when you die. Consequently, one of the most basic underlying principles which actually permeates our law on succession is the primacy of the will of the testator. 
between testacy and intestacy, it is testacy which the law categorically prefers because of the primacy of the will. The first thing to do, therefore, in succession is simply to determine what is the will, what is the intention, an gusto ng testator. Applying that criterion, of course, the first thing we have to do is simply follow the will. So, following that, we give the properties to those instituted as heirs, to those who have been given legacies, to those who have been given devices. That's the number one rule. Sundin mo lang ang gusto ng testator. All right. When it comes to the legitim, of course, that's off limits to the testator. Hindi niya pwedeng pakialaman yan. The only way that he can legally prevent a compulsory heir from receiving the legitim is through a valid disinheritance. But, by and large, that legitim is beyond the reach of the testator. So, give the properties to the instituted heirs, legatees, and devices. Give the legitim to the compulsory heirs. When it comes to the power of disposition of the testator, that includes not only the power to institute who are his heirs, who are his legatist devices. The law also gives him the right to name the substitutes, substitution. That's part of his right. So he can institute the heirs, he can also designate the substitutes. He can name legatist and devices, and at the same time, he can designate who will substitute for them in case of predecease, incapacity, or repudiation. All right. When it comes to the legitimate, however, that cannot be subject of any substitution, no condition, no encumbrance. Hindi niya pwedeng pakialaman. So, if there is a vacancy, nagkameron ng aberya, somebody predeceases, insofar as the legitim is concerned, there can be no substitution. Instead, what you can apply would be the rules of representation. Representation, pagdating sa legitim. Pagdating doon sa ibang portion, sa free portion, legacies, devices given to purely volunteers, substitution ang i-apply mo. If representation is not proper under these circumstances, or if there is no substitute and there is a vacancy, what is your next option? Diyan papasok ang accretion. Give it to the co-heirs, co-legatis, core devices. E kung walang qualified co-heir, what are you supposed to do with the vacancy? Ang last option is always intestate succession. Give it to the legal or intestate heirs. Posible ba na walang legal or intestate heir na titira? Hindi. Tandaan ninyo, in both the regular and irregular order, nasa buntot ang ating kabalikat sa kaunlaran. The state is always there. Pag wala ka ng kamag-anak na titira within 5 degrees from you, in the case of legitimate persons, uh, sino ang example ng 5 degree relative? Yung anak ng pinsang buo mo. The child of your first cousin can still inherit from you. And you can still inherit from that child. Because between you and your first cousin, there would be 4 degrees. So yung anak ng first cousin mo, pwede pa yan. 5th degree relative. Alright. So, basically, that's how you should deal with the problem of vacancies, the problem of distribution of the estate. We will further simplify it by drawing a graph. The applicable provisions, the applicable rules in case of a vacancy. So, isummarize natin yung applicable rules in case there is a vacancy in the succession. We distinguish between testate and intestate. With respect to testate succession, hatiin pa dandan yan sa dalawa. We distinguish between the legitimate and the free portion. Predecease, incapacity, repudiation. Alright. So, in case of Testate succession. Insofar as the legitimate is concerned, if a vacancy occurs, halimbawa, one of the compulsory heirs dies, predeceased, what do you do with this legitimate? I repeat what I said earlier. Pagdating sa legitimate, hindi pwedeng pakialaman ng testator yan. So, you can not have substitution. Walang substitution sa legitimate. You can have representation. Kung merong qualified representative, and in connection with that, you remember the rules of representation. For example, Representation exists only in the direct descending line. Kung ang surviving area yung legitimate parents, walang representation sa taas. A parent cannot be represented by a grandparent. Wala, wala, wala. Absolutely wala. Sa collateral line, wala ding representation. Except in the case of nephews and nieces who survive with at least one uncle or aunt. Yun lang. Eh, sa collateral line naman, wala naman dyang compulsory heirs eh. Di ba? 
wala namang compulsory sa collateral line. All right. So, ang posibilidad ng representation dito lang sa direct descending line. So, if there is a representative, you apply the rules of representation. Give the legitimate of the heir who predeceased to his representative. If he has children or descendants, give it to them by right of representation. With respect to the share of the predeceased heir in the free portion, if he was, let's say, a child, but he was also, aside from his legitimate, he was given a share in the free portion, instituted as a voluntary heir to a part of the free portion, first determine if there is a substitute. Kung may substitute designated by the testator, you give the vacant portion to the substitute. If there is no substitute, but there are co-heirs who were also instituted as heirs to the same free portion, then you give it to the co-heirs by right of accretion. Accretion can come in kung substitution is not possible. Assuming that the requisites for accretion are present, same inheritance, pro indiviso, or same portion of the pro indiviso, two or more are called. Going back to the legitim, if there is no qualified representative, kung walang representation, wala kang choice. Give it to the legal or interstate heirs by right of interstate succession. Dito rin sa share niya sa free portion, kung halimbawa walang substitute na dinesignate ang testator, wala ding qualified co-heirs, so hindi pwede ang accretion, ay wala kang choice. Pag wala ka ng choice, dun mo pamigay sa interstate heirs through interstate succession. In interstate succession, can there be representation? Yes. And remember, ha, in interstate succession, tingnan nyo, we do not distinguish between legitim and free portion because you're simply talking of the interstate share. So if there is a right of representation, the representative gets not just the legitim of the person represented, the representative in interstate succession gets the entire interstate share of the person whom he represents. So number one rule would be representation. Kung walang representation, no qualified representatives, give it to the legal or interstate heirs by interstate succession. Dito, sabi ko nga, that's a disputed point. There are those who would say that kung walang representatives but there are qualified co-heirs, pwede rin daw ang accretion. But I am more inclined to follow the view of Justice Orado that accretion in interstate succession would apply only in case of repudiation. But I suppose if a problem is asked and you answer it either way, either there is accretion or not, I, I think that should not be taken against you. Kung yun yung mismo mga sibilista, hindi magkasundusundu dyan. That's still an open question. Alright. Incapacity, the same as in predeceased. Pareho lang yan, ang applicable rules. Pagdating sa repudiation, syempre, ibang-iba ang mga rules. Why? An heir who repudiates cannot be represented. So, you cannot have representation. Pagdating sa legitim, an heir who repudiates can never be represented. What are you supposed to do with the legitim of the repudiating heir? Give it to the legal heirs by intestate succession. What about the share of the repudiating heir in the free portion? If he happens to be given a share in the free portion as a voluntary heir, klarong klaro yan sa 1016. Accretion. But before applying accretion, tingnan mo muna. Baka may substitution. If the testator designated the substitute, you give the vacant portion to the substitute following the will of the testator. So, substitution. Kung walang substitute, accretion. Eh kung walang accretion, walang qualified co-heirs, ay wala kang choice. Interstate succession. Okay? What about the share of the repudiating heir in interstate succession? Accretion yan. Give it to the co-heirs by right of accretion. Maliwanag yan sa Civil Code 1018. The share of the repudiating heir in interstate succession always goes to his co-heirs by right of accretion. Eh kung walang co-heirs, wala kang choice. Interstate succession. So, basically, that's how we can summarize in the form of a graph. So, first column, that would refer to the legitim, testate succession. Second column, that's free portion, testate succession. Third column, interstate succession. Let's assume X has four legitimate children, A, B, C, and D. Let's assume that C has two legitimate children, E and F. D has one. X dies with a will. In that will, he instituted as his heirs A, B, C, D. I give my entire estate to my children 
A, B, C, and D. Let's assume that there is an estate of 120,000. C, however, predeceased. D, repudiated. So, A, B, C, D are the instituted heirs. C, predeceased. D, repudiated. Estate is 120. How do we distribute? Your starting point should always be, how would the estate have been distributed? Paano sana naging gatian? If there was no vacancy, if there was no predecease, no repudiation, no incapacity. So, how would the estate have been distributed? A, B, C, and D would have received their legitimes as well as their shares in the free portion because the, the entire estate has been given to them. Legitimes would be 15,000 pesos each. Shares in the free portion would be 15,000 each. Okay, that's how the estate would have been distributed. Each would have received 15,000 as compulsory heir by way of legitim, and each would have received 15,000 as a voluntary heir. There are vacancies. What do you do with these vacancies? You apply that graph. 15,000 legitim of C, predeceased. Kanino mapupunta yon? ENF. There is representation. 15,000 should go to ENF. 7,500 each. So, okay ka na dyan. 15,000 share of C in the free portion as a voluntary heir. Determine, is there a substitute named by the testator? Wala. So, ano next option? Accretion. Who are the co-heirs of C? The co-heirs are A and B. A itong si D. Ah, wala yan. Forget about him. nag So, the 15,000 should go to a and B by right of accretion, 7, 5 each. Solve ka na dyan. Next, 15,000 share of D in the free portion as a voluntary heir. Repudiation dito, share of the repudiating heir in the free portion. Again, meron bang substitute? Wala. So, next option, accretion. Sino ang co-heirs ni Mr. D? A and B na naman. The 15,000 share of D as a voluntary will go to... A and B by right of accretion, 7, 5 each. Finally, 15,000 legitim of D. An heir who repudiates cannot be represented. Hindi pwede. Wala di siyang co-heirs dyan. Pagdating sa legitim, siya lang. He's the only one called to that legitim. So, wala kang choice. That should go to the legal or interstate heirs of Mr. X. Who are the legal or interstate heirs? A, B, as well as E and F by right of representation. So, the 15,000 will be divided into three parts. One-third for A, 5,000. One-third for B, 5,000. And E and F will divide the share which would have pertained to C if he did not predecease. And therefore, E and F will each get 2,500 each, which will be added to their 7,500 share by representation in the legitim of C. Therefore, finally, in the ultimate account, E and F will end up with 10,000 pesos each, while A and B will end up with 50,000 pesos each. That's how you should deal with problems involving vacancies in testate succession. If it is interstate succession, kung interstate, napakadali. X dies interstate, same estate of 120,000, same survivors. C, again, predeceased, D, repudiated. Pero interstate succession. All right. Your starting point is the same. What do I mean? Determine how the estate would have been distributed if there was no vacancy. Paano sana ang naging hatian? Kung walang namatay, walang nag -repudiate. So, since this is interstate succession, there are four legitimate children. Simply lang, you divide the estate by four. So, each one, if nobody predeceased, nobody repudiated, each one would have received 30,000 as interstate share. All right, there are two vacancies. The vacant share of C, 30,000 interstate share niya, karino dapat mapunta yan. It should go to his representatives. Meron ba siyang representatives? Meron. E and F. Therefore, E and F by right of representation will get 15,000 each. 30,000 interstate share of D who has repudiated. That will go to A and B by right of accretion. 15,000 to A, 15,000 to B by right of accretion. Therefore, A will end up with 45,000 and B will end with 45,000. While E and F will each get 
by right of representation, 15,000 pesos. So it's really much simpler if the vacancy should occur in interstate succession because for one thing, you don't distinguish between legitimate and free portion. You simply deal with the entire interstate share. Basta tanda lang natin yung graph and how to apply it. You not get lost, I assure you. No matter what kind of problem they throw at you, you'll be able to solve it. Just remember the basic principles which we have discussed, proper application of the various rules of succession whenever there is an interplay of factors. All right, let's now tackle the matter of capacity to succeed. In the case of natural persons, they can only succeed if they were living at the time of the opening of the succession. Remember, however, that even an unborn but already conceived child can already inherit, provided it is born later under the conditions specified in the law. If the child had an intrauterine life of less than seven months, less than seven months, it must survive for 24 hours from the time of separation from the maternal womb. When is the separation? When the umbilical cord is cut. Okay? If the child, however, had an intrauterine life of seven months or more, all that the law requires is that it should be alive at the time of separation from the maternal womb. Okay? Even if it dies five minutes later. Okay? Please take note that with respect to non-natural persons or entities and associations, it is possible for them to inherit even if they do not actually have a separate juridical personality. Okay? Pwede yon. For example, you have associations for uh, religious, scientific, cultural, educational, or charitable purposes under Article 1026, they can inherit. There may be dispositions made in general terms for uh, prayers and pious works for the benefit of the soul. <coughs> I think we are all agreed that the soul does not have a juridical personality. Diba? Okay? But it's allowed to actually benefit under a will. There may be provisions in favor of the poor of a certain locality. Wala naman separate juridical personality. Alright. You also remember the provisions of Article 43 of the Civil Code. Okay, sometimes nagtatanong ng mga problema involving application of Article 43. If there is a doubt, as between two or more persons who are called to succeed each other, as to who died first. <clears throat> Remember the rule. Whoever alleges the death of one ahead of the other must prove the same. In the absence of proof, what is the presumption? It is presumed that they died at the same time. And there shall be no transmission of rights from one to the other. That does not preclude, however, the application of the rules of representation. Okay? Halimbawa, father and son. Uh, hindi alam kung sino na una na doon. But the son happens to have his own children and descendants. I submit that the children and descendants can inherit from the grandfather by right of representation. Okay. You remember Article 1027. The article enumerates certain individuals who are incapacitated to inherit. Okay, tanda natin ang lista. Ha? Yung numbers 1 to 5, you don't have to bother about number 6. Yung individuals, associations, corporations, not permitted by law to, to inherit. Okay, yung 1 to 5. Number one, the priest who heard the confession of the testator during his last illness. 
or the minister of the gospel who rendered a spiritual aid to him during the same period. The incapacity extends to the relatives of the priest within the fourth civil degree, as well as to the church, chapter, community, organization to which he belongs. As long as a priest heard the confession, ha, nagpinakumpisal, heard the confession of the testator during his last illness, that priest is incapacitated to inherit from the testator. What is the basis, underlying basis of Article 1027? The possibility of undue influence. If the testator confessed to five different priests during his last illness, all five are incapacitated. Okay? In other words, the confession need not have been the last confession. As long as it was a confession during the last illness, then the priest would be incapacitated. If the priest, however, did not hear the confession during the visits to the testator, they would simply pray the rosary, read the Bible, meditate together. The priest is not incapacitated. Huh? For a priest to be incapacitated, he must have heard the confession. For ministers of other religious denominations, it is sufficient if they extended the spiritual aid to him during the same period. So if a uh, minister of the gospel, a Protestant pastor, for example, visited the testator during his last illness, and they read from sacred scriptures, they prayed together, that will be sufficient to incapacitate that pastor. But for Catholic priests, that is not sufficient. They must have heard the confession. Okay. If the testator confessed to a priest during his last illness, and then during that same period he makes his will, giving that priest a part of his estate, the priest cannot inherit, incapacitated. Okay? Kasama yung kanya mga relatives. Okay. But supposing that the will of that testator was made 10 years earlier, when he was still very healthy. Meron siyang kaibigan pari, si Father P. So, he had earlier made the will. 1995 pa, gumawa na siya ng will. In that will, he gave his friend Father P a part of his estate. During his last illness, Siyempre, ang tinawag niya para magumpisal, yung kaibigan niya, si Father P. And he confessed to Father P. Can Father P inherit? Yes. The incapacity would not attach. Why? There is no possibility of undue influence. Tagal lang nagawa yung will eh. Okay? Remember, the basis of 1027 is the possibility of undue influence. 1027, therefore, does not affect the legitim. If an heir, a compulsory heir, is incapacitated under Article 1027, he can still get his legitim. Why? Because 10, there is no possibility of undue influence insofar as the legitim is concerned. Why not? The legitim is something totally out of the control of the testator, whether he likes it or not, the legitim will go to the compulsory heirs. It does not depend upon him. So there is no possibility of undue influence, insofar as the legitim is concerned. That's the reason why 1027 cannot affect the legitim. 1027 does not also apply to interstate succession. It applies only in testate succession. Why? Eh, the law, paulit-ulit ang gamit ng law, testator, testator, testator. And, again, if you look at the 
reason behind 1027. There is no possibility of undue influence when it comes to interstate succession. Eh, kasi it is the law which mandates how the estate will be distributed depending upon who the survivors are. Okay? So, walang possibility. 1027 applies only to testamentary succession. It does not apply to interstate succession. It does not prevent a compulsory heir from receiving his legitim. Guardians, uh, with respect to their wards, if there are dispositions made by the wards before the final accounts of the guardianship have been approved. You remember, however, that in number 3 of Article 1027, with respect to guardians, there is a built-in exception. The law says, any provision made by the ward in favor of the guardian, when the latter is his ascendant, descendant, brother, sister, or spouse, will be valid. So, there is an exception. If the guardian happens to be the ascendant, descendant, brother, sister, or spouse of the ward. Number four, attesting witnesses to the execution of the will their spouses, parents, and children, or anyone claiming under them. This is simply a reiteration of Article 823. Okay? 823. Therefore, it should be read in conjunction with Article 823. There should also be a, an exception. An exception under 823, unless there are three other competent witnesses to the execution of the will. Number five, physicians, surgeons, nurses, health officers, druggists. Druggists. Hindi ang drug pusher or drug user. Hindi ang drugista. Druggist, yung pharmacist. If they took care of the testator during his last illness. All is required, they must have taken care. They must have taken care of the testator during his last illness. Otherwise, if a doctor was simply consulted by the attending physician, he was not actually the one who treated. Kinusulta lang siya noong mismong doktor. He is not incapacitated. There is an interesting question. Supposing that the doctor who took care of the testator during his last illness was his own son, okay, does the incapacity apply to the son? There are two uh, different views regarding the matter. According to one view, if the doctor, the nurse, who took care of the testator during his last illness is a close relative, like his own son, the incapacity should not apply. Why? Well, that's a true Filipino's first impulse is to rush to the bedside of a dying parent. If you happen to be a doctor or a nurse and you do not take care of your own parent while your own parent is dying, the entire barangay will ostracize you. Napakawalang kwenta mong tao naman. Ha? Namatay, namatay yung tatay mo, hindi mo lang inuwi yan, hindi mo lang inalagaan. You're expected. As a matter of fact, our strong family ties, I always consider that as one of our strongest points as a people. Okay? And I think that's true not only among Filipinos, but among Asians in general. Okay? Chinese families, etc. Uh, Koreans, um, strong family ties. So that's one view. The other view is that the son, who is a doctor, who took care of his father during his last illness, is also incapacitated. Why? Because there does not seem to be any intention on the part of the legislature to exempt close relatives. You compare number 5 with number 3 of 1027. In number 3, with respect to guardians, the law has expressly provided for an exception. It does not apply to guardians who are closely related to the ward. 
ascendant, descendant, brother, sister, spouse. Hindi sila kasali. If it was the intention of the legislature to recognize a similar exception in favor of close relatives, in number five, insofar as doctors, nurses, druggists are concerned, the legislature would have provided for a similar exception. But it did not. Okay? So, two different views. All right. Uh, remember that the incapacity extends to the relatives of the priest uh, or minister of the gospel up to the fourth degree. Let's assume that X is survived by the following. His first cousin, FC. So, how many degrees would separate X from FC? Four. Diba? And his three children, A, B, and C. A is a priest. Father A. He was the one who heard the confession of his father during his last illness. The will of X was made during the same period. And in that will, he said, I give my entire estate to my three children, A, B, and C. Okay? D is a doctor. Okay? He was the one who took care of his father during the same period. Oh, namatay si X, leaving an estate of 120. With a will. And sabi niya sa will, I give my entire estate to my children, A, B, and C. How do we distribute the estate? Oh. First point. As I said just a while ago, ha? 1027 does not affect the legitim. Because there is no possibility of undue influence pagdating sa legitim. So, there is no question that A, B, and C will still be entitled to their legitims. Even if they are incapacitated. Okay? Uh, sabi natin, eh, bakit si C kasama? Siyempre, relatives of the priest within the fourth degree. Hagip din siya noon. Kaya second degree relative siya ni a. Okay. Si FC, hindi na covered nung relatives of the priest. Kasi, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Fifth degree relative na siya nung pare. So, hindi na siya hagip. Does this mean that the rest of the estate, the free portion at least, would go to FC? The answer is no. Why? A, B, and C are incapacitated under Article 1027. Okay. What are you supposed to do with the vacancies created? Interstate succession. Interstate. E sino ang number one sa listahan ng interstate succession? Whether regular or irregular. Legitimate children and descendants. Sila pa rin. Okay? Sila pa rin. Okay? So, the entire estate will still end up with A, B, and C. Uh, I repeat, 1027 does not apply to interstate succession. It's without prejudice to interstate succession. Okay? Uh, next point. Yung 1029, tandaan lang natin ha, a disposition made for prayers and pious works ha, in general terms. That will mean that there will be a 50-50 division. 50% will be given to the church to which the testator belonged and the, 50, the other 50%, one half will be given to the state to be used for the purposes mentioned in Article 1013 of the Civil Code. And, uh, for the benefit of public schools, etc., public charitable institutions and centers. Uh, you don't apply, you don't apply the 50-50 rule if the testator is specified the application. Ah, kung in-specify niya kung paano gagastusin yung pera, you don't apply the 50 50 rule. Okay. So, kung ang sinabi lang niya, I leave 100 million for prayers and pious works for the benefit of my soul, apply the 50 50 rule. 
Okay? Kalahati sa simbahan, kalahati sa gobyerno. Pero kung in-specify niya kung paano gagastahin yung 100 million, sabi niya, I leave 100 million pesos for prayers for the benefit of my soul. In this connection, I order there should be 1,000 masses for me every day all throughout the Philippines in different parishes and churches. There should be special prayers for me every Tuesday in St. Anthony's Shrine at Bustillos. Every Wednesday, special prayers for me in Baclaran. Every Thursday, special prayers for me in St. Jude. Every Friday, special prayers for me in Capo. The entire 100 million will be spent for what he specified. Everything will be spent. Huh? The 100 million, ubusin lahat yun for those 1,000 masses every day, special prayers, etc. You don't apply the 50-50 rule. Kasi he specified the application of the property. Okay? 10.32, unworthiness. <clears throat> the law enumerates persons who are considered incapable of succeeding by reason of unworthiness. Okay? Just go over these provisions. They are familiar provisions. Many of them are also grounds for disinheritance. Halos pare-pareho yan. Okay. You take note, however, of paragraph 5, number 5 of 1032. Any person convicted of adultery or concubinage with the spouse of the testator. Please take note, the spouse huh, is not rendered incapable of succeeding by reason of unworthiness. Okay? Frankly, I cannot for the life of me understand can you imagine? Let's assume that our hero, Mr. X, has only one living relative. His brother B. Yun na lang ang natitira niyang kamag-anak sa buong mundo. X is married to a very beautiful lady. Okay? He comes home unexpectedly early one afternoon and he gets the shock of his life. There, on their own conjugal bed, was his wife and his own brother having the time of their lives. X uh, files a case against them. The two are convicted. Plain and simple adultery. Okay. Now, after they were convicted, our hero, Mr. X, dies of a broken heart. Okay. He dies. Intestate. He leaves millions of pesos. Who will inherit? His unfaithful wife will inherit everything. To the exclusion of his brother. Because if his brother had not been rendered unworthy under 1032, diba? his spouse concurring with the brother or sister, one half, one half yan. Dapat hati sana sila. But because he has been rendered unworthy, while the wife has not been rendered unworthy, everything goes to the wife. Kung suinong puno dulo ng milagro, hindi kasali sa unworthiness. Okay? Sabi ng mga ibang sibilista, this, the reason is that the law would rather live, the law presumes too much uh, in favor of the solidarity of the marriage. Ano solidarity? Kinaliwa na ngayon eh. Okay? Huh? And the law would rather leave it to the testator to decide whether he will disinherit. What's the moral of the story if anything like that should ever happen to any of you, knock on wood? The first thing you do, make even a holographic will and disinherit your unfaithful spouse. Okay? All right. I mentioned a while ago that many of the grounds for unworthiness are also grounds for disinheritance. Uh, Supposing that Mr. X has a son, S. May anak si X, si S. S is convicted of an attempt against the life of his, of, of his own father. That is a ground for disinheritance. That's also a cause for unworthiness. Uh, X does not disinherit his son. He does not. Pinabihan lang niya. 
before the death of X, however, there was a tearful reconciliation between father and son. Okay? Reconciliation. Ang tanong ngayon is, can S inherit? I submit that S cannot inherit. Why? He is unworthy. He is unworthy. To erase unworthiness, you need a pardon, express, or implied. An express pardon must be in writing. An implied pardon on the other hand can only come about if the unworthy heir is instituted in the will of the testator, the testator having full knowledge of the facts constituting the unworthiness. Since there is no pardon, express or implied, S is unworthy. He cannot inherit. Suppose, however, that after S was convicted by final judgment, X, his father, disinherited him on that ground. All right. And then before the death of X, again, there was a tearful reconciliation between father and son. Can S inherit? I submit that this time he can. Puede. Why? When the father disinherited his son, the father invoked the rules of disinheritance and submitted himself to the rules of disinheritance. And of course, one of the principles of disinheritance is that enunciated in Article 922. A reconciliation between the offender and the offended party deprives the offended party of the right to disinherit and renders ineffectual any disinheritance previously made. In that case, I submit the rules of disinheritance should apply. Okay? But to go back to the previous example, if X did not invoke the rules of disinheritance, there is no basis for applying the rules of disinheritance. It should only be the rules of unworthiness which should apply. Next point. When should the capacity of an heir be determined? As of what moment? Balik tayo ito sa ating paboritong article. 777. Therefore, the heir must be capacitated as of the moment of death of the decedent. Okay. That's the moment when there is transmission of successional rights. Therefore, capacity should be possessed at that moment. If, however, the institution, legacy, or device is subject to a suspensive condition, then contrary to the lyrics of that beautiful song which says that there is just but one moment in time, there will be two moments to consider. Moment of death and moment of the fulfillment of the condition. Capacity in that case must be possessed at both moments. Otherwise, the heir, legacy, or device does not inherit. Okay. Then you just remember yung 1039. Alam natin yan, ha? One of the aspects of succession. Remember, four aspects of succession which are always governed by the national law of the decedent. Regardless of where the property may be. Order of succession, amount of successional rights, intrinsic validity of testamentary provisions. You find the first three in Article 16 of the Civil Code. And finally, number four, 1039, capacity to succeed. On acceptance and repudiation, you just remember that uh, every gratuitous disposition, whether it be by way of donation or by way of succession, needs acceptance. You cannot be nobody but nobody can force his generosity down your throat. You may be the poorest man on this planet. Mas mahirap ka pa sa daga, sabi nga. But if you do not want to accept the generosity of another person, nobody can force you to do that. The law has such a high regard for individual personal dignity. There must always be acceptance. Okay? Acceptance and repudiation should be free and voluntary acts. And remember that they always retroact to the moment of death. Bakit na naman? Because of our favorite article. 
because it is at that moment when there is a transmission of successional rights. And the law does not want to have any interregnum insofar as ownership of property is concerned. That's the reason for the rule of retroactivity. Acceptance may be expressed or implied. It may be made in a public or private document. You remember that if an heir executes an act of ownership, which otherwise he could not lawfully do if he's not the owner, he is deemed to have impliedly accepted. Specifically, you take note of the provisions of Article 1050, where the law enumerates three situations when there would be implied acceptance. Number one, if an heir executes an act of ownership, he sells, assigns, donates his share. Okay? That's an act of ownership. Hindi niya pwedeng gawin yun if he's not the owner. He's deemed to have impliedly accepted. Number two, if there are several heirs and one of the heirs renounces his share, sabihin na natin, gratuitously, in favor of one or more, but not all of his co-heirs. Again, he is exercising an act of ownership. A, B, C, D, E are the heirs. A renounces in favor of B. A is actually exercising an act of ownership because he is selecting who will benefit from his share. So even if the renunciation is gratuitous, A is deemed to have accepted the inheritance. Third situation, if an heir renounces for a price, ay binenta niya yun. He is deemed to have accepted the inheritance. But if he renounces gratuitously and it is done indiscriminately in favor of his co -heirs, and his co are the very same persons who would have acquired his vacant share under accretion, he is not deemed to have accepted. Remember one of the rights granted to creditors under 1052. Uh, if an heir renounces his share in the inheritance, but he has unpaid creditors, the creditors are allowed to accept up to the extent of the respective credits. Okay? That's a protection for creditors. It's, of course, much easier to accept rather than repudiate. You can even accept by not doing anything. If an heir does not do anything within 30 days from an order of distribution, he is deemed to have accepted the inheritance. For repudiation, the same under the law may be made in a public document or in an authentic instrument or by filing the corresponding manifestation or petition with the settlement court. An authentic instrument, one whose authenticity, genuineness cannot be doubted. On partition, last topic, finally, prior to partition, the heirs are actually co-owners of the property which they have inherited. So partition is anything which is intended to bring about an end to the state of indivision. It may be done by the heirs themselves under certain conditions. They can even do it extrajudicially, poolang debts, no minor heirs. They can do that in an ordinary action for partition or they can have the partition in the settlement proceedings. Usually, this is one of the last things done by the settlement court in a settlement proceeding, di ba? Yung the approval of the project of partition. Sometimes the court will even have to appoint a commissioner to make the proposed partition. At a state or may make a partition, a person, as a matter of fact, under the new civil code, 1080, is allowed to make a partition of his estate during his lifetime, either by will or through acts inter vivos. And sabi ni JBL Reyes, this is sui generis, one of a kind. If a person makes a partition of his estate while he's still alive, pambihira yung dokumento yan. He is free to revoke it, to change it before his death. But if he does not, then that partition is to be respected, as long as the legitimes of compulsory heirs are not impaired. And this provision, Article 1080, takes on added significance 
in the light of certain decisions of the Supreme Court. I refer to those decisions where the court in fact considered void wills as valid partitions. The best example would be the case of Mang Oi versus Court of Appeals. Ano nga dito? There was an old man, Igurot, old man Tumpao. When he was quite old and he was, he realized that the, sabi nga eh, the shadows of life were lengthening, death was approaching, he decided to make a will. In that will, he distributed specific properties to his specific heirs, sa mga anak niya. So, kanya-kanya, itong loting ito, sa iyo, ito, sa iyo, ganyan. That was stated in the will. And then he called these children. He told them, oh, this is my will. The children read the will. And they all agreed, oh, we will comply with this will. Kung ano yung nakalagay dito sa, kung kanino man, yun ang susundin namin. They even went to notary public, the children. And they executed a document, notarized, stating that we have read the will of our father and we all agreed to abide by the provisions of that will. Old man Tumpao passed away. His will was never probated. And then, a problem arose. Some of the children wanted to get the properties given to the others. Nagkagulo-gulo. The case reached the Supreme Court. Sabi na Supreme Court, that will of old man Tumpao is a void will. Invalid, ineffective, was never probated. But it can be considered as a valid partition under what is now Article 1080. A void will can be considered a valid partition. Does this mean that we can now safely and conveniently forget about Articles 804 to 814 na pinaghirapan nating memoryahin? Not necessarily. For a void will to be considered as a valid partition under Article 1080, two essential conditions must be present. Number one, the will must in reality be a partition. Ibig sabihin, in the will, specific determinate properties are given to specific individuals or heirs. In such a way that if you follow the will, there will be no co-ownership. So talagang partition. And number two, very important, the beneficiaries named in that void will must at least be legal heirs. If they are totally strangers, there is no way that they can acquire ownership of the properties given to them under the void will. Why? Because you remember that the law enumerates the modes of acquiring ownership and partition is not one of them. Partition is not a mode of acquiring ownership. And you always need a mode of acquiring ownership to acquire ownership. Kung walang mode, you cannot acquire. So, the will must in fact be a partition and the heirs under that void will must at least be legal heirs. At least kung legal heirs yung beneficiaries under the void will, they would have a mode of acquiring ownership. Ano mode? Succession. Next point. On the effects of partition, I just want to emphasize a few important points. You remember that upon partition, there is mutual reciprocal warranty among the heirs with respect to title and quality of the portions allocated to them under the partition. The action to enforce this warranty prescribes in 10 years from the date the cause of action accrues. You remember that there are three situations when there is no warranty among the heirs. You find this in Article 1096. Number one, if it was the testator himself who made the partition, unless there is impairment of the legitimate of compulsory heirs, or unless it is clear that his intention is otherwise. So, kung yung testator mismo ang gawa na partition, walang warranty. Number two, if there is an express agreement among the heirs that there is no warranty, wala tayong warranty dito. Okay. And third, if the eviction is due to causes which arose after the partition. A partition is an agreement. It's a contract. And just like ordinary contracts, it is subject to rescission on the ground of lesion or damage. What is the amount of lesion or damage? Is the same amount of lesion or damage in ordinary actions for rescission of contracts. If an heir receives property whose value is less by at least one-fourth than that to which he is legally entitled, then he may ask for rescission. Prescriptive period, four years from the time the partition was made, which is the same prescriptive period for rescission of ordinary contracts. And then finally, you take note of 1104 and 1105. What will be the consequences in case an heir is omitted in the partition? or if a stranger is included in the partition. If there is only one heir, kung isa lang talaga ang dapat magmana, but somehow he enters into a partition with a third person, 
the entire partition is void. Why? Because everything should really go to Him. Walang karapatan yung third person. If there are two or more heirs, and then a third person gets included in the partition, the partition is void only with respect to the share given to the third person. Worst case scenario, there are several heirs, one of them is omitted, his share is instead given to a third person. In that case, it does not necessarily follow that the entire partition will be rescinded in the absence of bad faith or fraud. The portion given to the third person should instead be given to the omitted heir. And there will be a corresponding obligation on the part of the heirs who participated in the partition to proportionately contribute to the share of the omitted heir. Remember in this connection, the case of Viadonon versus Court of Appeals. A father and three of his children entered into a partition. They excluded a fourth child who was mentally retarded. Hindi nila sinama sa atian. In a case later on, the court said, it does not mean that the entire partition is void. Under 1104, unless of course it's clear that there is bad faith or fraud. But the heirs who participated in that partition are obligated to contribute proportionately to the share of the omitted heir. That should be all.